Welcome to Santiago de Compostela Parish as we come together as a community. Let's stand. If you remember the name of the person you met last week, please use them by name. If not, let's ask them what their name is and welcome them by name as we come together. Today we celebrate the 33rd Sunday in Ordinary Time, and let us begin our celebration proclaiming with great, with great love and joy our gathering hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Brothers and sisters, just as we now sing, all creation will dance and sing the glory of the Lord. We may do that sometimes, and we may fail at others, but the angels are at it constantly and they are here with us to be our companions in this worship. Let us pause for a moment to repent to our merciful God for the times we have not given him glory in our lives, but maybe even given Satan glory through sin and ask for his forgiveness and his mercy. the dead to life in the spirit. Almighty God, have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life.
Let us pray. Grant us, we pray, O Lord our God, the constant gladness of being devoted to you, for it is full and lasting happiness to serve with constancy the author of all that is good. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. I'd like to invite forward children who wish to participate in children's liturgy of the word. We invite the children to come forward now. Who'd like to hold the book? Would you like to hold the book? You're going to hear in today's gospel how Jesus tells us to never give up to always be faithful to Jesus. So listen carefully to today's gospel as you go in peace. So hold it up high. A reading from the book of the prophet Malachi. Lo, the day is coming, blazing like an oven, when all the proud and all the evildoers will be stubble. And the day that is coming will set them on fire, leaving them neither root nor branch, says the Lord of hosts. But for you who fear my name, there will arise the son of justice with his healing rays. The word of the Lord. Let the rivers 
stars clap their hands the mountains shout with them for joy the Lord comes to A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. Brothers and sisters, you know how one must imitate us? For we did not act in a disorderly way among you, nor did we eat food received free from anyone. On the contrary, in toil and drudgery, night and day, we worked, so as not to burden any of you. Not that we did not have the right. Rather, we wanted to present ourselves as a model for you so that you might imitate us. In fact, when we were with you, we instructed you that if anyone was unwilling to work, neither should that one eat. We hear that some of you are conducting themselves among you in a disorderly way by not keeping busy but minding the business of others. Such people we instruct and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to work quietly and to eat their own food. The word of the Lord. be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, o Lord. While some people were speaking about how the temple was adorned with costly stones and votive offerings, Jesus said, all that you see here, the days will come when there will be not be left a stone upon another stone that will not be thrown down. When they asked him, then they asked him, teacher, when will this happen? And what sign will there be when all these things are about to happen? He answered, see that you are not deceived. For many will come in my name saying, I am he, and the time has come. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified. 
For such things must happen first, but it will not immediately be the end. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be powerful earthquakes, famines, and plagues from place to place. And awesome sights and mighty signs will come from the sky. Before all this happens, however, they will seize and persecute you. They will hand you over to the synagogues and to the prisons. And they will have you led before kings and governors because of my name. It will lead to your giving testimony. Remember, you are not to prepare your defense beforehand, for I myself shall give you wisdom in speaking, that all your adversaries will be powerless to resist or refute. You will be even handed over by parents, brothers, relatives, and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name. But not a hair on your head will be destroyed. By your perseverance, you will secure your lives. The Gospel of the Lord. You have surely noticed the Sundays of ordinary time are passing by quickly during these shorter days of autumn. It's a nostalgic time, autumn is, with the lengthened shadows and the crisp air, more so this year than others, I think. It all suggests summer is past and winter is close at hand, at least as near as winter can get to be in Southern California. Thanksgiving is right around the corner, a cherished time for all of us. And this, today, is the 33rd Sunday in Ordinary Time, which means the Sunday after next Sunday is the beginning of Advent, a new liturgical year. As we grow in our Catholic faith, even if nobody tells us, we come to notice the Church runs on a slightly different calendar than the civil calendar. We call it the liturgical year. It shapes our liturgy, our worship, and it's based on the life of our Savior, Jesus Christ. His birth, his childhood, his messianic ministry, and ultimately his passion and death and resurrection and ascension are what give structure to our liturgical year. As in the Old Testament, our liturgical year is centered on salvation history, how God is drawing us back to himself. But since in the Old Testament our Savior had not yet come, the liturgical year for our ancestors back then focused on the Exodus, when God's people had been enslaved for 430 years in Egypt, the world superpower at that time, And God raised up Moses to bring them out of their enslavement to the promised land. Then, once in the promised land, they were able to live as God's people. And so the year took on another shape based on the agricultural year with its time of sowing and growing and harvesting from the first fruits to the final ingathering, as it was said, at the end of every growing season. This was all reflected in their liturgy, which acknowledged God not only as deliverer, but as creator and provider for all things, from life to the very things that sustain life. But every aspect of their liturgy, of their worship, their whole liturgical year was filled with 
fervent expectation for a Messiah because their reality reminded them that though freed from physical slavery in Egypt, they remained still in deeper need of a savior to deliver them from their spiritual slavery to sin, which they had inherited from our first parents, Adam and Eve. So their multitude of sacrifices were only symbolic, animals and grains, the best they could offer in worship, in thanksgiving, in reparation for their constant relapses into idolatry and injustice. But in the New Testament, we are blessed by our Savior, as St. Paul says, with every spiritual blessing in the heavens. There is no longer an excuse for us to live in disorderly ways, such as St. Paul was calling out in the second reading. In our modern-day terminology, we would say dysfunctional ways always leads to chaos. Our liturgical year no longer is based on the harvest, but on the saving mysteries of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And our sacrifices are no mere animal sacrifices, which amount to nothing. We offer Jesus himself to the Father in every Mass and our own daily sacrifices in union with him so that as he taught us, we can truly worship in spirit and in truth. We begin our liturgical year with Advent, a time of preparing for Christ's coming among us as man. Our Advent is a bit of a synopsis of the entire Old Testament when the church seeks to stir up in our hearts and souls a fervent spirit of longing for Christ not as though he had never come, but with the awareness that he is ever returning in the grace of the present moment, literally. And this is not mere imagination, because in fact, each year as we worship God, we enter more fully into the mystery of Christ as we celebrate his mysteries. We appreciate his grace, which he continually bestows on us, so we can be more and more involved in his saving work, which is even now at work in the world, where there is around us so much confusion. Ideally, then, as we come to the end of each liturgical year, like now, we should be at a higher level spiritually than when we began last Advent, which means concretely we are more motivated by Christian charity, which means unselfish love, and therefore more effective as instruments of evangelization and of healing in the world. If we aren't growing this way organically, what happens with every beginning of a liturgical year? We start here, we might manage to rise a little bit like a loaf of bread, and then we just wind out, petered out again. But it never stays the same. We usually go a little bit lower if we don't grow. And so in a dysfunctional culture, even Christians, even Catholics, are just up and down and up and down and up and down. And that's what makes history counterproductive and frustrates the work of our salvation. So, as we come now to the end of another liturgical year, Jesus calls out to us from the gospel in a way that always seems a bit drastic and severe. If it didn't sound a little bit drastic and severe to you today, you weren't listening. He reminds us there will be a day of reckoning. He knows that though he has given us so much and has asked of us relatively so little, we can be tempted to take grace for granted, especially in our culture of entitlement. We can actually forget about him 
in the practical details of our daily life. We can forget his gospel. We can almost compartmentalize it into one hour every Sunday and call ourselves practicing Catholics. We then fail to cooperate in the salvation of the world. And to the measure that we fail, the world is at risk. And so in the gospel today, some people had been marveling at how the temple there in Jerusalem was constructed of massive and costly stone. Some of those stones were as much as 100 tons in weight. How did they move it? That's another story. Herod had built that temple over 43 years in a very impressive manner. Unfortunately, though, not to give God glory, but to give himself a reputation. He was like Solomon II. Jesus took the opportunity then to remind those who asked him. He said, all that you see here, the day will come when there will not be left one stone upon another. These hundred-ton stones will be like rubble at the base of the embankment. They imagined, surely, he was not speaking of the end of the world, since they couldn't... They imagined, surely, he was speaking of the end of the world, because they couldn't imagine anyone laying a hand against such a mighty fortress as their glorious temple. Thinking, therefore, he was speaking of end times, they then asked him the next logical question, right? Teacher, when will this happen? What sign will there be when all these things are about to happen so that we can be prepared? He was, however, speaking to them about the end of that temple, which would happen in less than 40 years, when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD, and there was nothing left to the temple except some chunks of stone. He also took the opportunity then to remind us now, you and me, that our own world is but a place of pilgrimage, and there is no place here we can securely stand to anticipate eternity, so we shouldn't be attached to it, but rather zealous for the mission of our Savior, which he gave us on the day of our baptism. Jesus reminds us that there will be an end to this present world when he will come again to judge the living and the dead, as we will shortly pray in our creed. But it shouldn't come as such a surprise to us who live our faith. We know it's coming, and we're not worried if we're walking hand in hand with him. For others, however, it will come as unexpectedly as the destruction of the temple for the Jews in 70 AD. In fact, just a few chapters earlier in Luke's gospel, Jesus likened his second coming to when the flood came in the time of Noah. Remember what he said? They ate and they drank and they married and were given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all, except Noah and his family in the ark. So will it be, Jesus said, in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. You can imagine what it must have been like thousands of years before Christ when Noah built that ark, which made Herod's temple look like a playhouse. I mean, think about it, brothers and sisters. It was 450 feet long. That's one and a half football fields. And it was made only of wood, gopher wood, whatever that is. Built in the middle of the plain, far from any body of water. We couldn't imagine in our day, even with our technology, how to build such an ark out of only wood. But Noah did. He built it. And let no one tell you it's not a fact. Some people think they have such bright minds, they realize, they say, 
oh, that wasn't real story, that was just a myth. Well, Jesus didn't consider it a myth. And Jesus knows all things. So, Noah did as God told him. He obeyed, and he built this ark, notwithstanding the mockery of his entire civilization around him. I suppose even his sons probably thought he was just a little bit cuckoo. The mountains behind my abbey in Silverado Canyon bear the fossilized witness that that flood took its toll, as our archaeologist told me when we were doing our earthwork. Jesus is not trying to scare anyone, just to remind us what the devil would like us all to forget, that all the grace in heaven is bestowed on us, not to squander nor ignore, but to apply like the talents in the gospel, not to hide like a light under a bushel basket, but to share and let it shine in godly and loving lives, a godliness and a love that is willing to run the risk of bearing witness to the saving truth, even when it will bring us persecution. If it hasn't yet brought you any persecution, even just some ridicule, sometimes even by your own family members, even your father or mother, you might ask yourself, am I really living the gospel? Because we like Christ, Christ, if we live the gospel, we'll be persecuted, but we must be merciful enough to do what Noah could not do, that is, to share the light of the gospel of life, even when it wins us misunderstanding and ridicule, even persecution, even if we are called to bear witness with our very lives, as some in our age have done. For then, like Jesus, we will forgive the ones who persecute us, may even take our lives, and our charity will be unselfish enough to call down his mercy upon them as he called down the Father's mercy upon us on Calvary. And so open up the floodgates, not of punishment, but of salvation for those who persecute us. Let us stand and with the confidence that the Holy Spirit who dwells within us gives us proclaim our prayer of faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation he came down from heaven and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. 
I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Trusting in God's mercy, we now offer our prayers for the church and for the whole world. For all who are persecuted or imprisoned for their faith, that they rejoice to share in Christ's suffering. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For victims of war, earthquake, and famine, that they receive help from around the world. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For families divided by religion, that Christ restore them to loving unity. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our community of Santiago de Compostela, that we persevere in times of trial. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the intentions of, for the repose of the souls of Jack, Kate, Farah, and Edward Hormosi, and Maria de Jesus Flores, as well as for the other deceased of our parish, Matthew Piccolo, Colombina Ginko, Oscar Vergara, all souls in this month of November, Omar Vega, Lydia and Roger Inzen Jr., Eddie Mata, Gloria de la Cruz, Napoleon Mateo Jr., Milagros Salvador, Ricardo Sanchez, Marilyn Gray, Milton Tennant, who just died yesterday, Monico Nuki and Delphin Samson Jr., as well as for all those veterans who have served God and country and given their lives for our freedom. For the sick, especially Andrew Murray, Maria Diaz, Isag Isagani and Zosi Masalvacion, Patricia Grisalca, Ed Moore, Marika Santi, Felicidad Garcia, Antonio Flores, Juan Palacios and Jim Belma. And in thanksgiving for graces received by Javier Barajas, Indrani Mahalindra, Normas Lagos, Merli Odi, Fathers Aaron Riomalos and Joey Manaran. And for those intentions we carry in our hearts and those in the ark of prayer before our altar, we pray. God of all creation, you have the power of life and death. Grant what we ask in your Holy Spirit through Christ our Lord as we pray together the stewardship prayer. God, God my, my creator, creator, you made, made me all, all that I am and gave me all that I have. Help me show my gratitude by using these gifts to serve others in your name. Jesus, my redeemer, you taught me the way to eternal life by your example of loving service to others. Grant me the courage to respond to your call to discipleship by following in your footsteps. Holy Spirit of God, be with me as I choose each day to put you first in my life. Let me be a model of Christian stewardship so others will come to know you through my actions. I pray, dear Lord, that you, that you open, open the minds and hearts of all the men, women, and young people of our parish, that we may joyfully accept your challenge to be good stewards. Amen. God of all creation. 
Pray, my dear brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, our Almighty Father. <clears throat> Grant, O Lord, we pray, that what we offer in the sight of your majesty may obtain for us the grace of being devoted to you and gain us the prize of everlasting happiness through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. With Lift up your hearts. <clears throat> Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, right and just. it is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For out of compassion for the waywardness that is ours, he humbled himself and was born of the Virgin. By the passion of the Christ, he freed us from unending death, and by rising from the dead, he gave us life eternal. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. fitting time of the year just to remind you as we offer this Eucharistic prayer, listen closely and see how the church empowers us in this Eucharistic prayer to pray for all the scattered children of God. That's a very powerful word which we encounter in our reading of sacred scripture, those scattered abroad because of sin. And she also leads us to pray not only for our own reconciliation and redemption, but for all the world. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy, and you never cease to gather a people to yourself so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, 
at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing and broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. Mystery of faith. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Until Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous death, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you willed to reconcile us to yourself, Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with Saint James, and with all the saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May this sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth with your servant Francis, our Pope, Kevin, our Bishop, Timothy, Thomas, and Todd, his brother bishops, the order of bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you have gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you have summoned here before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who were pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever.
At our Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. But deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Peace be with you. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. For the sake of our brothers and sisters who have to join us live stream, we pray together. Uh, my Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I offer you above all things to receive you into my soul, since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally.
Let us pray. <clears throat> we have partaken of the gifts of this sacred mystery, humbly imploring, O Lord, that what your Son commanded us to do in memory of him may bring us growth in charity through Christ our Lord. Please be seated. We have a special announcement from our pastor. It is in the form of a challenge. So let's watch. God be with us. As we now move towards a new liturgical year, I'd like to invite everyone to a pre-Advent or Advent challenge. And this is, the first one is based on Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 40 which is about taking care of the poor, attending to the needs of the poor and the needy. We are no strangers to these bins that we see here in our church plaza, which belongs to South County Outreach. Why South County Outreach? Because I believe that when we give to South County Outreach, we don't only attend to the poor who come into our church, but we attend to the poor and serve the poor in general. So the challenge, Matthew 25, verses 31 to 40, consists in three steps. One, pick up three or more of these brown bags with the list of sound county items needed that are non-perishable food items. Number two, distribute it to one or two of your neighbors and ask them if they can fit it up with the items that are specified. And then number three, collect these bags, hopefully before the third Saturday of each month. And as you collect the bags, please bring them to the church or deposit them into the bins so that they can be sorted and collected by South County Outreach. Are you up for the challenge? I do hope so. And I do hope we respond to this challenge from our hearts because we love and we care here at Santiago de Compostela Parish Family. I love you all. God bless. And I was told by Father Thomas to make one minor correction to that announcement. He said three, and they suddenly calculated and said, we won't make it to six o'clock today. So please pick up one or two bags to give, maybe one for yourself and one for a neighbor, but use that as an opportunity to evangelize for the neighbor. Um, um, our Emmanuel ministry is here to pray with you and for you. Our Emmanuel ministry is to help people who are supporting, who are hurting. So we ask you to take a moment and visit our Ark of Prayer that's on our plaza. And there, will be, there are volunteers there who will just talk with you and pray with you every Sunday. But we encourage you especially to go today. Um, next weekend is our last weekend of ordinary time, as Father, Ta as Father um, Greg mentioned. We keep passing time. And on the last Sunday of ordinary time, we celebrate the um, Christ the King. And so we will have a Eucharistic procession inside church at the end of every one of our liturgies to remind us that Jesus is the King of the universe and the King of our hearts. Simbanga B, speaking of things, calendar coming up quickly. Simbanga B, which is our Advent Novena Masses, is coming. There's a table outside for those interested in volunteering and to donate. So we'll have a spiritually uplifting preparation for our Christmas season. For people who don't know what Simbanga B is, it is a Filipino tradition. As I've been told in the Philippines, it's generally at 4 a.m., the nine days before Christmas. However, here in the States, we cheat. It's at 5.30 a.m. So what a deal. You get to sleep in an extra 90 minutes. But it is, if you've never been part of it, it is a beautiful celebration where we come together and to see in the nine days before Christmas, to see this church filled with love, it's a wonderful thing to be part of. And this year, the first three days, we have three different bishops presiding. And then we also on the plaza have our Advent prayer booklets, and we also have, um, we also have our shoebox, um, Operation Shoebox, which is another way we reach out to the homeless. We ask you to stop by the plaza. And Stuart is holding up our inflatable donut. And anyone who can eat that donut, 
But if not, there are smaller ones on the plaza that you can participate, or in the pavilion afterwards, if you wish. And now, this being the second weekend of the month, I invite everyone to please stand. And we like to always say on the second weekend of the month a special prayer for those who are grieving the departure of a loved one and for those who have dis disabilitating sickness. Almighty. Almighty and eternal God, our Father, by your blessing, you give us strength and support in our frailty. Turn with kindness toward your sons and daughters who are ill. Grant them strength and comfort amidst the challenges they experience. Restore them to health of mind, body, and spirit. Merciful God, your son wept at the tomb of Lazarus. Walk with those who are grieving the departure of a loved one. Hear your people who cry out to you in their need and strengthen their hope in your lasting goodness. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. One last announcement. The Knights caught me on my way in to tell me they have the Blue Book for Advent. Gives you a little reflection for each day of Advent. It's a great aid to going a little deeper in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and in prayer in that time of growth. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go and announce the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God.